Oh, it's a mystery every time. Every no, yeah, exactly. So we're we're all right. <laughs> so we weren't we weren't actually live there. There we go. Now we're live. Where are you, John? You've disappeared now. <laughs> oh yes, I see is. Okay, don't let me just quietly. All right. We are live. We're live. Let's go for it. And I'll, I'll put uh, 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 the comments tonight. So, Yeah. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another Ball Caps and Bagpipes NLBMR webcast. Uh, I'm John McKellar of Ball Caps and Bagpipes. And I'm the other half of Ball Caps and Bagpipes. I'm Jason Durr. I'm the owner of uh, Dugout Classics and uh, also known as Bub on Baseball. I've got everything kind of covered today. So, John, yeah. we've got two guests on tonight one, one of them uh, we've worked with before and another uh, another new one which we're very excited to bring on yep first off tad richardson is back from uh, his break uh, he's joining us for this one break. <laughs> maybe a break a break from seeing you guys i had to stay away so i could do, I'd do some actual work <laughs> <laughs> you're part of the team now tad and we are joined by a very special guest this evening the vice president of the buck leonard association brian patterson Hello, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Obviously, we're here tonight to talk about the impact and legacy of a very special ball player, uh, Buck Leonard. Um, why don't you start, though, by telling us a bit about yourself and the association and the work that you guys do? Okay, so, yeah, um, again, my name is Brian Patterson. I am uh, the grandson uh, through uh, marriage. Buck actually married my grandmother which is his was his second marriage second wife and uh also my mother's the ceo of uh buck leonard association for sports and human enrichment so why don't you talk us through a bit of uh what the association does uh, obviously you have a lot of youth programs yes. um i was uh, on the website earlier today and a couple of terms jumped out sure, um, give me, at give me. Little, i'll give you a little history um Actually, we, we, we were founded in 1999 and incorporated in 2003. And uh, um, we actually started off the whole idea. Uh, the, founding, the founding members were uh, Lugenia Leonard, my grandmother, and of course, uh, my mom, Rose Hunter. And the whole idea in the very early stages was uh, to start an uh, organization um, directly uh, concerned with uh, historic preservation in our town, right? And that's the way, we, that was the whole idea, uh, was about historic preservation. Um, but then we got approached in, in 1999 um, by a group of uh, ministers and black entrepreneurs in the area. They were running the, uh, the uh, baseball league, uh, both Leonard Baseball League. And they approached us about uh, actually taking over and, and running uh, this baseball league. So it was like, okay, so we, we kind of switched over to a youth and sports organization. And uh, um, we, 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 we dove into the baseball program, you know, and recruiting players and such. And uh, then we became our RBI affiliate, uh, reviving baseball in inner cities. Uh, that's uh, uh, a platform from uh, Major League Baseball. And uh, I think at, at, our, our, at our high, we had close to maybe 400 players, 300, 300 to 400 players. And we were serving, uh, you know, uh, the county, surrounding counties. And uh, it just kind of actually snowballed from there, man. And, and, and of course, we by my mother having a uh, background in education, we inc incorporated some educational uh, platforms as well. Um, so that's a little backdrop on that. We we actually, it's kind of amazing right now because, <laughs> you know, I can remember when we started out, we actually owned a, another home uh, next door to, 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 to Bucks. And uh, we, our headquarters were, was out of that particular home. And uh, we moved to an office space and it was barely big enough to house a, a desk, 
a computer, and we were just jammed in there, man. It was like, you know, it's barely any room. So we definitely come a long way. Yeah. Um, when so I was say, in... before, before that, so you said you had 400 players. So just to see the example, we, we've got 100 players at the most in Scotland right now. <laughs> so you can see more than us. I, yeah. But I, I guess, you know, a lot of, we start off very early, you know, so we're talking about five to eight year old division and then kind of uh, moving up to your more competitive divisions, uh, you know, uh, 15, uh, 15 and 16 year old. So we just got a huge response. I tell you, it was just, just like this, the snowball effect, man. And, uh, then we had neighboring counties as well. Um, that also, uh, traveled to play, you know, it was, it was a very, very competitive league. And we, um, we kind of, uh, 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 uh modeled our, uh, baseball, uh, teams after, Negro league team, um, right. you know, of course we had to have the grays, right. Of course. And, uh, right. And we also had the Baltimore stars, which Buck, um, played for, um, he almost starved to death with the Baltimore stars. And, um, we had the Brooklyn Royals giants and the New York black Yankees and the Cuban giants and the Chicago giants. It was, it was, uh, the Monarch, the Monarchs. I can't leave those guys out. So, I mean, and, and a lot of these, the, the coaches, you know, I actually went to high school with, you know? So it was just, it was, it was, a, it was a great environment. It's a family environment. And uh, we, you know, that would, that's probably about 75% of, of what we do with the program. Everything is, was centered around the baseball league. And then the other programs can't, kind of came along with the baseball program. Yeah, you mentioned the other programs. Uh, from what I saw in my research, you have the full diamond math and science education and oh, the yeah. performance so, arts as well, introduction to instrumental music. How did those two uh, get integrated to, into the, the baseball side of things? Well, you know, of course, when you, well, let's, let me back up. Let's back up, okay? Because I have to take you all the way back to the beginning, okay? Because uh, a lot of our kids come from um, the projects or, or, or the housing authority, uh, uh, public housing authority, right? So in, here in Rocky Mount. And so a lot of these kids are under-resourced, but they're very talented kids. So once we got them into the baseball program, right, we were like, hey, you know, we need to, these kids, they don't just want to play baseball. They just want to continue the whole year round, you know, we were getting calls like, hey, you know, where you guys at? You know, mm -hmm. we want to do things. So we started out with a hobbies and pastime program. And that was kind of our first, I could say the first little uh, 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 branch of our educational process was doing the pastime and hobbies program where we had um, uh, uh, adults come out and teach the kids how to play chess, just positive pastimes. Um, we even had some golfers, you know, come out and stuff like that. And, and, and from there, it just grew into what we now have, uh, our STEM collective. And uh, as you were alluding to, uh, the full diamond program, which takes the baseball field as as we all know, I think Jason and, and, and Tad, I'm not sure, John, if you played baseball when you were a kid, but you probably did. No? Okay. So no, anyway. I, was, I have played for the last uh, few years, but not when I was a kid. Okay, so, you know, just growing up on my block, you know what I'm saying, we used to play uh, all sports. So every season there was a sport to play. But baseball was one of those sports, man, I tell you where math, you were learning math, without really knowing you were learning math, right? It was different from like doing homework from school when your teacher, you were keeping up with averages, RBI, stuff of that nature. And so it teaches you math. And then further fr from that idea is what the full diamond math program is based on because, you know, the baseball diamond is full of math, it's geometry actually. So what better way to teach uh, kids uh, 
than having to move, man. I don't know about you guys, but I hated to be in class, man. It was like, <laughs> I, I mean, it was like, that makes you make it better. Right? I mean, I was like, I was one of those kids where I was like literally watching the clock. It was like, but, um, but you know, recess was the best time of day. I'm just gonna tell you. <laughs> and so, you know, kids they they have to move, man. It's a no, and 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 it's a shame that uh, here in the states, our, our school programs are eliminating a lot of that stuff, um, budget cutting and stuff like that. But so you get the kids out there, you teach them math wh while they're moving. So that's a full uh, diamond math program. And then we also have, uh, okay, that's a picture of uh, our excursion program, right? So uh, uh, we get the kids out, we we take them to uh, uh, exhibits. I think this is one of our uh, uh, um, our um, uh, that's at the uh, Arts Institute, and they have a uh, a wonderful astrological program there. And so you get the kids out, man, you get them moving and stuff like that. And uh, they just take it all in so much better. So, um, yeah. And then so before we move on to the subject, I was going to ask you with, uh, with getting them out and learning math and baseball, do you find it harder? Because again, everyone keeps saying baseball is dying sport. And we always hear that. Oh, it's dying. There's no one's interested. The kids aren't playing it these days. Are, are you finding it? kids are still relating to baseball or they find it maybe really easier to say basketball and football? Well, there's no doubt that the basketball and football are big uh, here, you know, and definitely my area. And uh, a lot of our kids, they play, uh, they play basketball and they want to play football. But here's the thing though. And I'm going to tell you this, a lot of kids that come of our program, they might not end up being baseball players, but they make heck of football players. I think we had like four quarterbacks come out of our baseball program, right? Yes. And actually, you know, throwing the football, man, it's amazing because you we incorporate throwing the football into uh, strengthening their arms, right? Because throwing a baseball, as you know, can be, you know, damaging on young arms, but Throwing a football for some reason, it develops arm strength and doesn't wear the arm out. So, but yeah, so it's a, uh, uh, you know, you you've heard of gateway drugs. Well, baseball is a gateway sport, man. It, it, it's like, <laughs> it's like right. So you uh, you know you play baseball, man. It's the first thing people. It's the first thing kids want to do: pick up a ball and hit a ball, right? Yeah. I mean, we've all, we've all done it, you know. Pick up rocks and you know, hit them, you know, <laughs> hit pebbles, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, it was just one of those things, again, uh, I, baseball for me was something I played from uh, year-round except for basketball season, and that was it. And basketball season got me in shape for baseball season, and that was it. So, you know, um, but yes, I mean, we, we find out here people people struggle to get into baseball here. So John's example, you don't really find baseball here till kind of maybe your early 20s and so you and then the other big problem here is people don't play um, a lot of sports besides out of golf and cricket their hand-eye coordination sports so the main for, sport being soccer so people play their sports with their feet so it's an interesting combination for us to learn how to do stuff with hand-eye coordination and it usually takes a little people time to, to uh, get hand, the hang of that over here unless they come from a, a cricket background and then uh, they have that hand-eye coordination well well you know definitely you know, uh, football, I guess soccer is definitely a sport that a lot of great athletes, you know, transition from. I mean, foot, the foot coordination, man, a lot of times it's all about the feet, dude. You know what I'm saying? It's all about the, the lower body, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember, uh, you know, just being in, in, in practice, basketball practice. It's all about your feet, dude. So, yeah. So, but, um, <laughs> And, I, and, so, and so just building off of our STEM collective, um, I, I have to mention our uh, intergenerational coding project, right? And this is just, uh, was just, this was a, the brainchild of, of, of my mom, the CEO of uh, uh, BL Ash, um, 
it was uh you know it was a, it was it, it, the project just doesn't take the children and teach them basic coding skills it takes the mothers and grandmothers right and when you really think about it and you know when you really think about it who needs it most i mean okay so you teach kids how to code right and that's great but are they the ones that are going to go out and earn a paycheck <laughs> I mean, no. So <laughs> you get the whole family in there and you get, you know, you teach them coding, man. So, and this is, uh, man, I, I was, um, I was so proud of this, this particular project that we were doing. Um, and the kids were so responsive to it. And then when you put them in the same classroom as their grandmothers, man, it, then it becomes, it, it's like a, you know, it becomes full circle, right? Mm -hmm. So and um, we are going to continue this particular program. We, you know, I think uh, 2020 was our first year of, um, you know, uh, doing this program, piloting this program. And so we're looking forward to, 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 to continuing uh, this particular program. So, yeah, it was a great one, man. The kids were, this young lady, I tell you, um, she was so... I mean, she got it immediately. It's like she was the youngest in there, and she got it immediately. Like, <laughs> you know, she was leaving everybody behind. Like, you know, but yeah. So that is something I'm very proud of, and so we're going to continue with that. That's amazing. That's I got, I, I've got a web background. I, I don't have a background on coding, and I, I've tried coding, and it is not easy. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, if you can, if you get your head wrapped around coding, that that's an absolutely amazing thing. The 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 older you get, the harder things become, man. I mean, it's just just the way it is. It's, it's you know, just when you get the wisdom part worked out, you know, just when you be, start becoming who you're supposed to be, man, you, you, you your body breaks down, your memory breaks down. It, it's really not fair. It should be kind of like in reverse but anyway so. yeah what um what jumped off the screen at me when i was on the website was the term playing to learn and it certainly sounds like you guys uh that sounds like it encapsulates quite well what you guys work towards um that's excellent um who was who was about to speak there sorry i just interrupted someone i think brian was that's right <laughs> it's okay i mean uh no i'm the good. Well, you know, I guess I guess I can go on and talk about and one of our other pilot programs, guys, was actually our bibs program, right? That was uh, baseball, ice cream, and books. Oh, and, right. Please tell us about okay, this. You know, we 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 talked about that, and you know, really, to be honest with you, when I heard it, when I first heard it, you know, I was like. I wasn't super excited about it, um, you know. Um, and, you know, it's like, you know, baseball and ice cream. But then, you know, because I'm always start thinking baseball and 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 peanuts, man. But anyway, but um, that was an excellent program because it we we wanted um, the parents to get back to reading to their kids, right? <laughs> And, and also the, the way to, to entice kids to learn is by bribing them, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you bribe kids, man. It's the, you know what I'm saying? If you want your kids to, I don't know if you guys got kids. I know Tad mm -hmm. has kids, but yep. if you want your kids to do something, you bribe them, right? So <laughs> Um, the ice cream, man. So the ice cream was like, you know, you got the ice cream, the kid is going to come, he's going to sit right in that chair. You got the book, you got, you got, you, you've got their attention, man. So, and, uh, we actually had our volunteers there, um, go into, um, the homes and that's, uh, Ann, uh, Harrison, She's on uh, the right, and my mother's on the left, and that's uh, in the middle. That's uh, one of the parents, but Anne, she actually works for the Rocky Mount Housing Authority, right? Mm -hmm. Public housing. So uh, that that gave us a strong relationship there, 
and we were able to go inside the homes and actually uh, read to the kids. So that was one of the uh, initial programs, pilot programs that we did. And, uh, and then, and then naturally, man, the other driving force with all of us, I mean, how, how important is music? Music is just very important in everybody's lives, especially young kids. Yep. And so we started this music program and we had a music instructor that happened to work in the same office building as we did. And she was actually, uh, this young lady, I, I forget her name, but um, she actually had a uh, head hunter's uh, service for uh, jobs and stuff like that. And we found out that she had a musical background and we wrote the grant, you know, uh, raised the money, bought some instruments and, and, and taught the kids how to play, man. So that's, uh, that's another one of our programs that we do. That's excellent. So you guys have got a bit of a full plate. Um, let's talk about, now that we've covered the association, of it, let's talk about Buck. Let's talk about Buck Leonard, the man. Uh, before we do, boys, for a change, I did do some research and I've taken quite a few notes and uh, I've been astounded by what I've read. Um, let me just run over some of the accomplishments and achievements uh, of Buck Leonard's life. Um, so Walter Fenner, Buck Leonard, was born September 1907, passed in November 1997, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so 19 years old. Thanksgiving Day. Passed Thanksgiving Day. Yes. What a life. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a person to be thankful for. Um, a long life, a hard life, but a full life. Um, Batty clean up behind the, the legendary Josh Gibson for several years as a member of the Homestead Greys. He was with them between 1934 and 50. Also spent some time in Mexico. Uh, grew up in North Carolina. Was a first baseman and was known as the Black Lou Gehrig. Uh, he's in two Hall of Fames, at least. He was uh, inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 72 with a career batting average of 320. Uh, there's way more. <laughs> he was a 13-time Negro Leagues All-Star, a three-times Negro Leagues World Series champion and owned a Nationals Ring of Honor. Um, he was ranked 47th in 1999 among the 100 greatest players of all time. And... Uh, Won a batting title in 1948, batting 395. Uh, so <laughs> quite an extraordinary man and an extraordinary player. Um, Ryan, if you could, would you tell us a bit about the man behind the player and uh, more about your family um, and how you guys uh, fit into the, the story of the Negro Leagues? Okay, so, um, yeah, so when I was growing up, um, well, I'm going to back up just a, a little bit. So, um, Buck, you know what I'm saying? I've been knowing Buck since I can remember. I, I don't remember a day without really uh, growing up without Buck in my life. So, so but um, he, um, of course, like I, I alluded to before, um, he was married, and I think he got married in 1937, and um the, the the young lady's name was Sarah, and uh, she was she was married to a funeral home owner, and you know, but he passed away in 1935, and 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 this is way before I was born, but and then in, in 1937 they got married, and they were married for a long time. I mean, I think they were married for like 30 years or so. Um, I think she passed away actually in 1966. So. Um, Okay, that's the photo there, and that's Buck, of course, and uh, that's his niece to, um, to to my far right, and his sister is on the other side of him, the young lady with the glasses, uh, that's Lena, and then behind him is my uh, grandmother, Lugenia Leonard, his second wife, and then behind um, and my grandmother is uh, Mr. Prather, um, that was Lena's husband so so anyway and i you know I, I grew up i knew uh uh we call her willie b um that was his niece uh i, I you know i knew her and i i have i have some memories of his of his uh his sister so but um yeah so anyway um after his wife died and and so forth and so on 
uh, there was a long courtship between Buck and my my grandmother, and um, you know, um, you know, they were just an item, right? So, um, yeah, Buck was like he was a he was a man's man, you know. I guess I could describe him as a Renaissance man. He was a hunter. He was a religious man. <laughs> he was a business owner. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with him. And uh, I just remember, man, like, you know, he had, he used to come over and he would, he would come over, you know, and um, he would always come bearing gifts. So it was always, you know, exciting to see this guy. And, um, and that was, that's during the time where he was courting my grandmother. And he would also come over and bring, you know, uh, he was a hunter. So he would come over and bring things like squirrel or something like that, uh, or um, birds, birds. Uh, I can't even remember the name of these birds that he would hunt, but um, uh, some type of fowl or something like that. But he bring those things over, man. And my grandmother would be in the kitchen cleaning them and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, first time I realized that this guy was like famous, right? Is I had this uh, report to do in school. You know, you have to, you know, kind of give a, a, a bio on the most important person you knew. And so I was still in elementary school. I think I was like in the fourth grade or something like that. And I went to school and I got the, so, so I did my report on Buck and I can't remember what I said, but I went to school that day and I had a, these Hall of Fame baseball cards, right? I didn't really think anything of them, right? Cause I was around them all the time. I was, you know, around these things, but I went to school that day and, you know, so the whole class, even the, the teachers and stuff, they were just, I was like, I was like a celebrity, man. These people were just <laughs> rushing me, you know, and I was just a little kid, but it just went off a light, went off in my head, like, hey, you know, um, there's something to this, this, you know, playing sports thing, right? And, but, you know, because that, that I mean, I could just remember like, you know, the girl that you, were scared to kind of say something too, but that particular day, you know what I'm saying? It was like, you know, it was easy. I mean, they actually wanted to be around me. I was like, <laughs> it was so cool, man. It was like one of the best school days of my life, right? Well, um, yeah, so, you know, uh, that's just one of the stories, man. But yeah, just, just rolling around, uh, driving around the city with Buck and he had this Jeep and, and uh, Tad was talking about, you know, him being, you know, one of the proudest days, looks like one of the proudest days of his life. He had a real estate company, right? And he had this Jeep, right? And it was such a cool Jeep because it wasn't just like a car, you know, to a kid with like trucks and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so I was just right around town with the guy, man, as he made all, I guess, doing business, man. So, yeah, that's just one of the stories right there. Did he tell many stories about his time playing? You know, um, not to me, you know, I didn't listen. So I have a brother and, and, and I didn't play baseball, right? But my brothers played baseball. So they were, you know, more into the baseball aspect. They were asking questions about his playing days. I didn't have that, that same type of relationship. I didn't have that baseball relationship with them. However, there was this one time <laughs> – you know, there was a football game, right? There was a foot, high school football game. And, you know, being a teenager, you know, I just, you know, you, I'm going to the football game. I wasn't playing football game, playing football. I was going to the football game. And, and uh, I was like, I got to have something to wear. I want to be, you know, sharp for the ladies or whatever. <laughs> so I, um, so my grandmother, she was like, yeah, she's like, listen, Let's see if Buck will let you wear his Homestead Grays jersey. I mean, his his jacket, you know. I was like, but I got the call from Buck. You know, I got a call from Buck. Yeah, come on, come over, and I'm going to let you wear, you know, my team jacket, right? And so, you know, I can remember that day because it was like everybody was waiting. I 
went over to this house and everybody was waiting, you know, and I was walking down the hallway and everybody was just looking at me, right? And so Buck was standing there at the end of the room. He had the jacket, right? The jacket, right? So and I put the jacket on, man, and and well, he only let me wear it for that night. I had to bring it back. <laughs> 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 um, so you had to yeah, come back man. dry clean as well, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, man, and and, and so yeah. Excellent. Brian, <laughs> what what rules did he give you? Well, you know, he about the about the jacket. <laughs> oh, about the jacket. <laughs> yeah, um, that's like he, he being really, carrying the keys to your car the first time. Yeah. Was, I mean, filled up with gas and all that. He he, you know, he really didn't say anything. I think he was just. He was like, it was, it was, I could tell he was happy about it, right? Because I think it, you know, had been sitting up for so long and for me to wear it. And he just, he was, you know, he was as happy as I was about that whole thing. But my mother was there. Of course, my grandmother was there. My, I think even my uncle, and I was just like, that was just that moment, like, you know, here's the Holy Grail. And it was like, that was cool. Neat, neat. So Brian, um, we spoke with Sean Gibson of the Josh Gibson Foundation previously. Um, given that uh, Gibson and Leonard batted three and four for the Homestead Grays during some of them, you know, these were some of the greatest teams in Negro League history. Um, are you aware of any kind of a personal relationship that those two had outside of the game? And if there was, has that carried on between the families as you guys have set up the foundations and, uh, and worked toward uh, maintaining that legacy? Well, I do know this, that Buck thought very highly of Josh, right? And so, and, 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 and he, and they had this, this relationship where, you know, um, Buck even mentions in, in, in some of his, in some of his books that were written about him, that um, his batting average was so good, got so much better because of Josh, right? Because he was hitting behind Josh Gibson. And, um, and then again, Josh, when Josh would go um, to play with Satchel's team um, and, you know, the, the owners at the time, then look, they, they frowned at that. But Josh went away, he would go away and play with Satchel's team. And, and he would tell Buck, you know, listen, you, you know, you got to carry us through, you know what I mean? Keep us, keep us on par. So they had that, I knew they had the mutual respect to, uh, between them. Um, the camaraderie, uh, camaraderie was there, and like I said, uh, Buck said, you know, don't let him forget about Josh. So the relationship, just on, even though I didn't, I wasn't privy to it, just on that, you could tell that those guys were were close and they respected one another. And it's even to today, I mean, I mean, um, having this relationship with Sean, you know, um, our organizations is. Is, um, Josh Gibson Foundation and our organization. I mean, we work out for each other, you know. And Sean is he's 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 always come and supported us, and we we support him as well. So, you know, and and and, and me and Sean, we we get along um, very good. So, you know, just it, it continues on, man. The legacy continues. It's kind of it's kind of funny, you know, when you think about it. But it's kind of, you know, one of those things like you know. But um, yeah, so our organizations are very tight. We, we we love Sean. We refer to each other's family. So yeah, definitely. To carry on from that and off the back of that, um, tell us about how the family have carried on and added to Buck's legacy, um, both within the association and uh, beyond. Well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought that up because you know I was like. And before I come on the show, you know, I had, I was like, well, you know, cause I'm not a historian and stuff like that, but so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading stuff and, and things of that nature. Cause I don't know what you guys are going to ask me. And, but um, anyway, so I'm reading, you know, this book and this particular author, I'm not going to call his name out. He says, one of the reasons that, you know, he, he kind of wrote this book because you know, Buck didn't have anyone to carry on his story, you know, that, that would carry on his legacy. And I was like, is that, that's the most untrue 
powerful thing I've heard, right? I didn't even know it was in this book, right? And it was right there. So I can't believe this guy said that because the book was actually written in, I believe, I want to say in 90, I want to say it was written in the 90s. So I'm just amazed because anyone that had been around us and come to Rocky Mount, they were going to see this, this interaction of this family, you know? And uh, so, but anyway, so Buck uh, wasn't the kind of guy to, to, to brag or to boast or talk about his greatness, right? He wasn't that type of fellow, man. He, you know, he would, I would ask him and he would just play it down, you know? And, I, you know, and so then I would go back and read about him and in some of his interviews and he wasn't as hump, that humble, you know, that as, as he was with me, because he would say some things like, he would, you know, he would say, because he told me, he said, hey, listen, I said, Buck, did you ever hit Satchel? I was like, no, never hit Satchel. Then I read in the book and he's quoting, yeah, I, I mean, he was like, Satchel's a great player, but I, I fared, you know, I did fare against him. That's a long way from my never hit Satchel. <laughs> But anyway, so he was that type of he was that type of guy, you know what I'm saying? He would never brag or boast about his accomplishment. He would always talk about um other people, how great other people were. And, you know, about his about the culture. You know, it was more about the culture of the baseball life than it was about how many home runs I hit or whatever. It was the as they say, one of the things you remember. You know, at, if you play, you don't think about, you think about the locker room stuff, right? You think about, mm -hmm. it, the, the, you value the relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, uh, that's what, but Buck, I think he would be um, very proud of the way that we have, you know, kind of carried his leg, legacy forward, uh, how we tried to keep his name out there. How we we kept on telling the story, how the 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 um, the association kind of take takes on his his personality, so to speak. I mean, even though he wasn't, you know, I'm not gonna say he was an introvert, but I'm just saying he would never he was he was quiet about his business, right? So he'd be very proud of that. But one thing about this guy is that even though he was a legend in other places, you know, um, that he wanted to come back to a small town, right? He wanted to come back to little old Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, that probably most people have never heard of, right? But that's where he wanted to be, right? And so, and, 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 and uh, um, guys come up to me to this day that are a little older than I am, and they would always tell me about, the, the the words of encouragement the book had because you know buck he was a he did a lot of different things man and so he was a truant officer he was a truant officer so if he kept, he caught you skipping school you know that was you didn't want to see him you didn't want to see him you know what i mean so um but he 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 would tell guys you know because i guess guys did most of the skipping school but anyway uh, he would tell guys like, "Hey, you know, you need to be in school. You need to get your education." Buck value his ed value education, right? And he would always, I mean, for years. Every time I walked through the door, you know, he had this thing, and I felt like I had this pressure on me for for a long time because he would always he his expectations of me were like, "Hey." you're going to play professional ball. So every time I came in the door, it was like, you know, for years, it was like, you know, you mo you made the ball uh, club yet? You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> no pressure. Not, not some big right. shoes to fill or anything. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, um, you know, so it was kind of, you know, I don't think I ever told him that I wasn't playing because he, well, he, he was, I mean, even if, when I was, I guess, you know, a young adult, you know, past my prime of playing sports, he would always assume that, I, I guess, because he played forever, he just thought everybody else played forever. And, but that is, 
is not that way for, you know, our, us lesser humans, you know. I was done playing sports a long time ago, but he was like, he was always asking me every time I came to that door. So, but, um, yeah, so I think he would be very proud of the way we've, we've carried on his name and um, things of that name. Yeah, for sure. I would agree with that. I think the work you guys are doing is fantastic. Long may it continue. Um, we're going to wrap up by talking about the webinar just shortly. Uh, before we do, though, uh, Tad, Jason, uh, we'd like to give you guys both an opportunity if you have any other questions for Brian. Tad, you go first. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any questions per se, but I just wanted to kind of add to, to the story. And, and before we talk about the webinar a little bit is just the um the the work that that uh well first of all the was just truly uh, you know grateful for the opportunity just to meet brian and and through sean and and we've had the opportunity now over the last couple months to since i think november to really start um you know talking about marketing and talking about branding and, and talking about the opportunities that that we see but um and really moving some things forward and it's been fun and we've had my wife's help and we've had help from the community and um but what what we really see and like like the things the thing that's amazing that that uh, there's there's lots of things that that they do that's amazing um but the the steam programs in particular and are 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 where the opportunity really lies to make a big, big difference in the world. And so it's like, you know, I'm kind of this, uh, you know, marketing mad scientist kind of guy. And, and uh, my, my big, my big, big, uh, you know, philosophy is that we can fix major, major problems on the planet um, with, but it's going to take the deepest pockets in the world and the deepest, deepest pockets in the world um, that, that are most accessible are marketing dollars, advertising dollars that all of these big corporations spend. Um, and uh, advertising, the goal of advertising is to create value for your consumers. And there's no better way, there's no better way to provide value to another human being, to another parent for sure, than to help their kid. Um, there's absolutely no better way to provide value to another human being who has a child than to help raise that child because it absolutely 100% takes a village. Mm -hmm. And what's magic about what they've been doing, the, the family has been doing over the last 20 years is that they've built their village. <laughs> they've created the village. Um, and so what what we're really trying to do with the help of the NLBM art community and with some other people that we've kind of, you know, have seen what we were doing and, and, and offered up some services. Um, we're, we're really trying to, to create more opportunity um, to attract those corporate marketing dollars into this organization, the Buck Leonard Association. Um, and there's, there's uh, there's absolutely no better. I'll tell you this. I think um, <laughs> Brian and I were probably the two dumbest guys. I don't know, Brian. I apologize, but probably the two dumbest guys on the board call the other night. <laughs> you, they have an impressive board, Ted, and Ted, they're Ted, Ted, Ted. not dumb. We were the we, we were the less accomplished people. <laughs> I'm, I'm never, never going to be dumb. Not, not going to admit to dumb. Okay. I, I appreciate that. That's some good coaching. Yeah. At least accomplished. Yeah. At least accomplished that. Yeah. Well, yeah. The smartest yeah. guy in the room. You surround yourself with guys who are smarter than you. Yeah. That's, that's what it's all about. Oh, oh yeah. So, for sure. I'm teasing. Yeah. You know, you, you kind of, you, you said a little bit about, Brian, you talked about, um, you know, the, the, the culture that that Buck, you know, um, that really, really he valued, and it's all in the relationships, and it's all, you know, really it comes down to community, and and that's what this, you know, how we, you know, all kind of came together is through this concept of, um, you know, community-based marketing, and 
And uh, so this has been fun. This, this, this whole project, like, you know, I had never expected to be having an opportunity to work with, with Brian um, and the Buck Leonard Association furthest thing from my mind, frankly, when we got started in this thing, but there is so much opportunity um, to create the, the shortest path, I, path. I absolutely believe this, the shortest, shortest path to solving the problem of the diversification of the workplace, specifically in the fields of STEM, um, exists between tech resources that are in the other room right now working and uh, um, the kids who need it the most, the kids who've, who've lacked access to the, to the best technology the most and who don't, you know, wouldn't normally stand a chance to have access to the best technology. The shortest path to solving this problem of the diversification of the workforce for, force is, is between these great big tech resources out here and the Buck Leonard Association and other foundations like them like the Josh Gibson Foundation and so on. But the, and, and the gold that they've spun is trust. You know, they, they have built the trust, they have built the community and all we have to do if we wanna fix the world is help them, simple as that. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're building all the marketing around right now. You know, we're really trying to, to invest some time and resource and, and uh, and, and uh, you know, do something, frankly, that probably should have been done, absolutely should have been done years and years and years ago, you know. Uh, anyway, so it's been fun and, and uh, there's more to come. I, I, we've, got, we've got some very interesting prospects that we're kicking around right now. Oh, uh, stay tuned, stay tuned. Sounds interesting, looking forward to this. Cool. I, I, I've just got one question for you, Brian. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to the guys on Facebook. They all said hello. So Sergio, Daniel, and Matt, thanks for tuning in. Um, love in the comments. We'll get back to you guys later. They're more or less saying they're really, they love us. Everyone here, they love and they enjoy us here. But uh, so going back to the book and the ice cream in particular, what type of ice cream would you suggest to have when you read the book? Cause I'm an ice cream guy. That's so as a dad, one of the things I decided to do was buy an ice cream machine and you'll make ice cream for my kids whenever they wanted it. So they always had that memory that dad made homemade ice cream. So I want to know what kind of ice cream you would suggest for, for, with the book. Well, I tell you what, I mean, coming from an adult perspective, I, I, you know, butter pecan or something like that, but kids and nuts, I don't know about that, but you know, I would, I would chocolate man, chocolate or something with a, Chocolate swirl, I would think, you know, I mean, I, you know, but if you're making a homemade, I don't know how difficult that might be for you. No, no, it's actually really easy. It's okay. Uh, right, well, to be fair, I, ha I have a, a family friend who, who makes small batch ice cream and I have the opportunity to pick his brains on how to do these things there. So, um, I, and, and of course you really can't fail with ice cream too much. It always tastes pretty good no matter what you do. <laughs> if, if somebody, if somebody does it like your ice cream, man, you, you're, you're doing something wrong. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Pick up a, another hobby. If somebody does, doesn't does like your ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all I wanted to ask there. So I, I was dying to ask that question earlier. So I wanted to make sure I got that one in. But I did, I did forget to mention one thing that I would like to bring up because I left it out. And, sure. uh, but, you know, you're trying to remember everything. But um, it's about uh, our, our preservation program that are, are a leg of what we do. And I want to bring up, I'm coming soon, and we're, we're working hard towards it. Um, it's the Buck Leonard Learning Resource Center at the Mitchell House. That's a lot, man. I know it's a lot of words, but I just want to get, uh, that's actually Buck's home right there. So, and wow. that's, on the, yes. that's on the local registry. And here is the, the Mitchell House, which is uh, about uh, arms, you know, a rock throw from Buck's house. So the Mitchell House is actually where we want to, uh, where we're building this resource center. And uh, the, the Mitchells uh, were a, 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 a family that lived in Buck's neighborhood. And um, 
they uh, they used to. I don't know if you guys ever got a chance to see the Green Book, um, but this house wasn't in the Green Book registry. But this house was based. To, uh, this house served as like a, a a makeshift motel, if you will, a hotel where some of the black entertainers could stay when they visited Rocky Mount. And I'm talking mm -hmm. about so I'm, I'm not I'm talking about some very accomplished musicians. I mean some um, band members with Duke Ellington. And also back in the day, you had the Harlem Globetrotters and uh, guys of that nature. So just stay at this house. And we were lucky enough that one of the the, the daughters, living daughters or living, living members of the Mitchells, she donated the house to our organization. So oh. um, we're, yes. we're, we're in the process of restoring the home. Um, so that it can house our uh, learning center, uh, our freedom library, if you will, where kids can actually learn why they learn, uh, read about themselves. Um, also, we want to use that as a, 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 a historical center, if you will, where we can have a lot of memorabilia and artifacts of that nature, if you could call them, uh, 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 in history. and. Uh, and, and at a computer lab, right? So we want to do a lot of things around that house. So we're actually working on the home now. I mean, I've got um, uh, uh, some more uh, 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 worker bees that are going to be uh, 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 re uh, renovating the house uh, next week. So um, we're looking forward to getting that that straight. Well, I just want to I wanted to mention that that's that's uh, that's going to be amazing when we finish it. Sure. All the best with the continued uh, renovation with that. Um, now, let's close up. Uh, you will be going into a bit more detail on some of the work you do this coming Sunday, 28th of February, the final day of Black History Month, um, with your webinar. Uh, now, there are three tiers of ticket pricing, including a giveaway. Uh, do you want to tell the audience about that and where they can find tickets? Oh, yeah. Sure. What, what I, I'm going I'm to take the first phase of it, then I'm going to let Tad jump in with his group at uh, you know MLB Mart. Um, so yeah, sure. So the the event is on uh, the Eventbrite platform. It's called a dream fulfilled, unfulfilled. I should say a dream unfulfilled, uh, honoring the Negro Leagues and the players who lived it. So, and this is just right off the the the. Uh, piggybacking right off of, of Major League's uh, decision to include or recognize the, uh, the the stats from the Negro Leagues from 1920 to 1948. So this is going to be interesting dialogue. It's going to be a, a round table of ex-Negro League players, living players. We've got Larry Legrand. We've got Dennis Biddle. We've got um, uh, James Cobbin. And I am leaving somebody else out. I can't, uh, let's see, uh, did I name? Oh, and also we've got an award-winning journalist who um, is, is, a, is my homeboy. You know what I mean? He went, we went to high school with, with each other. Um, his name is Ernie Sub. So Ernie was actually a, a bat boy, you know, with the Rocky Mount Pines and which was under Buck's management. So it's it's like full circle guy. I mean, and Ernie has went off, you know, I remember, I barely remember Ernie to tell the truth. I mean, I, I hope he doesn't see this. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how it is. I mean, he was my brother's friend. They had that little circle. He was my youngest brother's friend. They used to come over and stuff and I barely, you know, mm -hmm. A two-year difference is a big deal, but I think I was a senior, sure. guy, you know, so I barely paid him. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, but anyway, because it was funny when I, I hadn't seen Ernie in I don't know how many years, and so he was, he was like, Brian, man, you know, you used to be so tall to us, you know what I mean? You used to be this giant, of, you know what I mean? And so, but yeah, so, but Ernie is with the uh, Atlanta... Atlanta uh, Journal Constitution now. He's an award winner, uh, winning journalist, and so forth. So he's very accomplished, and we're we're happy to have him moderate this uh, this round table. 
so I believe the other uh, the other attendee will be Chuck Walters. Is that right? Yeah, Chuck Did Walters, mention, yeah. who came in on basically on the at the end of uh, as, as Negro leagues were winding down, mm-hmm. and uh, he had all these guys got stories to tell. But his is fascinating. He actually, you know, his his, his time was it was kind of short. So he has a story about that, how they kind of disbanded and how they went on the road to Barnstorm. They were supposed to play all these games in a limited amount of time and how the, um, that kind of fell through. They were going to do a tour of the Deep South. So he'll go he'll go into that. And I know uh, Mr. Walters uh, fairly well. And uh, he's a, a, a businessman. He's since retired. So. He, he's uh, he's interesting to talk to, and uh, uh, I haven't I haven't met uh, Mr. Uh, Cobbin as of yet, so I'm looking forward to meeting him. He's a very uh, ex- uh, uh, established businessman. I mean, this guy owns a business tower, and he also is the CEO of the Negro League Foundation in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, and he also has a uh, a, a, a traveling uh, uh, business and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be just great uh, to have all these guys. Get, and Larry Legrand, let me tell you, Larry Legrand. Now that guy, you want to hear about a guy having a bunch of stories. Now this guy is the character in the room. So he's, I mean, when everybody tunes in, they will have a great time. Him telling some stories, some detailed events about what the big release was like the trouble those guys got into and all that kind of good stuff. So, yeah, it's going to be quite interesting. Excellent. And that will be at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, That would be 7 p.m. UK time for anyone who's watching this, if you want to get a ticket. We'll fire up the link to the Eventbrite page on the Ball Caps and Bag Crates Facebook just shortly after the broadcast. Um, And that's called A Dream Unfulfilled. That's coming up this Sunday, the 28th of February. Uh, Brian, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, and an honour to speak with you today. Um, Thank you so much for joining us and uh, all the best with the webinar. Uh, Obviously, keep up the good work with the association and, uh, of course, in these times above all, stay safe. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Brian. I look forward to hopefully having you on again another time. And and it's been an absolute pleasure. I I can't thank you enough for spending an an hour from two dudes in Scotland. So, (laughs) well, yeah, man, I never thought I would be actually talking to two dudes in Scotland, but (laughs) hey, man, it's it's been it's been tremendous, man. It's been it's been great. I appreciate the time. Thanks, thanks again for for having me. I appreciate it. We we will have you anytime uh, that you are free to come on. Uh, we oh, appreciate yeah, it so I, much. I need I need this. I need this, man. Anytime somebody uses honor and pleasure when they you know greet me, man, I need to have, keep you guys around. You know, <laughs> honor, honor thing, man. That's just hey, man. It's, it's it strokes the ego, man. I'm telling you. So thank you for that. And <laughs> thank you, that. and thanks uh, to you, Tad, for joining us again. I uh, hope you will be back for the next one as well. Um, Guys, uh, anyone watching, uh, thank you so much for joining us live. Um, or if you're watching this on demand, thanks for checking uh, checking out the, the show. Um, we'll be back uh, hopefully next Tuesday with another another of these uh, webcasts. Uh, so we don't have a guest yet, but we'll work on that one. Give us a week. But anyway, you should be watching the webinar this Sunday. Uh, <laughs> it's actually on a U- friendly UK time, so I think I'm going to go and get my ticket as soon as I'm done here. Thanks again. Thanks for the support, guys. Appreciate it. No problem. Thanks, everybody. All right, man. Have a good night. All right. You too. See you later, Ty. All right, buddy. All right. Bye-bye.